Hello everyone, I am Dr. Donald Ozello of Championship Chiropractic in Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome to Dr. Ozello's Sports Medicine Report. Today I'm going to speak about a lumbar spine disc bulge and disc herniation. This is going to be a two-part video. Today I'm going to speak about the anatomy of the lumbar spine, the intervertebral discs, and the lumbar spinal nerve roots. In the next video, I'm going to speak about a disc herniation and disc bulge, explain exactly what they are, how they occur, what the symptoms are, and what you could do to help to prevent and rehabilitate a lumbar spine disc herniation or disc bulge. But today I'm going to speak about the anatomy because I want to split this video up because I want to make sure that you completely understand everything and I don't want the video to be super long. So today I'm going to speak about the anatomy of the lumbar spine and the intervertebral discs and the spinal nerves in the lumbar spine region. The intervertebral disc is often abbreviated to IVD and they are located in between the vertebral bodies. In the lumbar spine, the intervertebral disc is located below the corresponding numbered vertebrae. For example, L1 intervertebral disc is located below the first lumbar vertebrae, which is numbered L1, and above the second lumbar vertebrae, which is numbered L2. The function of the intervertebral disc is that it provides a measure of shock absorbing protection to the spinal column and it appropriates stability for the spine during load bearing activities. It has three components, the nucleus propulsus, the annulus fibrosus, and the vertebral end plates. Again, the intervertebral disc has three components, the nucleus propulsus, the annulus fibrosus, and the vertebral end plates. The nucleus propulsus, is often abbreviated to NP, is comprised mostly of water and contains cartilage cells and collagen fibers. It is gel-like and has the consistency of toothpaste. It contains protoglycans, which attract water, which in turn supports the disc structural integrity. The nucleus propulsus is avascular and its primary function is to sustain and transmit pressure that is exerted throughout the vertebral column. The annulus fibrosus, there is a transition from the nucleus propulsus to the annulus fibrosus, which is gradual. It occurs from the central portion of the disc moving laterally in all directions. Fibers become progressively more distinct towards the periphery of the disc. The fibers are arranged in alternately oriented concentric ring layers. This contributes to the tensile strength of the annular ring. The annular fibers are thicker in the anterior aspect than in the posterior aspect. The intervertebral disc contacts the vertebral end plates of the superior and inferior vertebral bodies. The end plates are not distinctly part of the disc. They are best viewed as part of the vertebral bodies. The end plates cover the entire nucleus propulsus, but do not completely cover the annulus fibrosus. They only cover the inner aspect of the annulus fibrosus. They are strongly attached to the disc while weakly attached to the vertebral body. The spinal cord ends between vertebrae L1 and L2. The conus medullaris is the tapered end of the spinal cord. The cauda equina, which is Latin for horse's tail, arises from the conus. It is a bundle of spinal nerves and spinal nerve roots. It consists of the second through fifth lumbar nerves, the first through fifth sacral nerves, and the coccygeal nerves. These nerves innervate the pelvic organs and the lower limbs. They provide motor innervation to the hips, knees, ankles, and feet. The nerve roots descend vertically before exiting between the vertebrae through the neural foramina. The nerve roots travel below the corresponding pedicle. For example, spinal nerve root L1 exits below the L1 pedicle. The L5 nerve root exits below the L5 pedicle. A myotome is a muscle or muscle group that a single spinal nerve root innervates we, when we speak about the motor nerves. Spinal nerve roots L2 and L3 
innervate the iliopsoas muscle. The iliopsoas performs concentric hip flexion. Spinal nerves L3 and L4 innervate the quadriceps muscle. When the quadriceps muscle is contracted concentrically, it performs knee extension. Spinal nerve root L4 innervates the tibialis anterior muscle, which when contracted concentrically performs ankle dorsiflexion. Spinal nerve root L5 innervates the extensor hallucis longus muscle, which when contracted concentrically performs great toe extension. Spinal nerve roots S1 and S2 innervate the gastrocnemius muscle and the soleus muscle. When these two muscles are contracted concentrically, they perform plantar flexion. Myotome for spinal nerve root S2, which innervates the hamstrings. The hamstrings, when contracted concentrically, perform hip extension and knee flexion. So again, a myotome is a muscle or muscle group that a single spinal nerve root innervates. Several of the lumbar spinal nerve roots control reflexes. The L4 spinal nerve root controls the patellar tendon. The L5 spinal nerve root controls the medial hamstring tendon reflex, and the S1 lumbar nerve root controls the Achilles tendon reflex. Dermatomes are areas on the skin where the sensory perception is controlled by a spinal nerve root. L1 spinal nerve root controls the proximal anterior thigh. L2 spinal nerve root is the anterior medial thigh. L3 spinal nerve root is the medial epicondyle of the femur. L4 is the medial lower leg and medial malleolus. L5 is the anterior lateral lower leg and mid dorsum of the foot. S1 is the lateral lower leg, lateral malleolus, and lateral portion of the plantar aspect of the foot. S2 is the posterior medial thigh and lower leg. S3 is the ischial tuberosity and infragluteal fold, and S4 and S5 are the perianal area. As you can see, there is a tremendous amount of anatomy involved in the lumbar spine when I speak about the intervertebral disc, the spinal cord, the nerve roots, and the areas that those nerves innervate. Again, there are motor and sensory nerves and reflexes that are controlled by the spinal nerves. So go ahead and take a look at all the pictures that I used, and you can also check the references that I used for this information. It will help you a great deal to understand exactly why the symptoms of a lumbar disc herniation or a lumbar disc bulge are as intense as they are and why they cover so many things, why there can be a change in reflexes, why there can be pain, why there can be weakness, why there can be a change in sensation. So go ahead and study that. And then next week I have another video coming out, part two of the lumbar disc herniation and disc bulge, where again, I'm gonna speak about the symptoms, the contributing factors, the prevention and the rehabilitation. Thank you everybody for watching today's video where I spoke about the anatomy of the lumbar disc herniation and lumbar disc bulge. Again, this is part one of a two-part series. I am Dr. Donald Ozello of Championship Chiropractic in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am the author of Running, Maximize Performance and Minimize Injuries. You could go to my website, championshipchiropractic.com, where you could find additional information on the book and you could also find my blog. My blog contains articles on chiropractic care, spine health, sports medicine, health, fitness, and nutrition. So please visit my website, championshipchiropractic.com. Thank you very much for watching today's video. Please feel free to like this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube page, and please feel free to leave a comment, suggestion, or feedback in the comment section below. Again, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Always remember to train hard, but train smart. Get adequate rest between your training sessions. 
utilize nutritional and supplementation strategies that work for you, stay injury free, rehabilitate your injuries, and accomplish your goals.